his concerns and his fears just fell on deaf ears. They didn't want to hear the guts and the gristle. Hey, yeah. But as a man of the law and what he stood for, well, he knew that he was on the wicked. So do you think that the prosecution of David McBride is purely political? Absolutely. Yes, absolutely outrageous. The Labor government promised to bring in strong whistleblower protections and they've done nothing. You're from the Alliance Against Political Prosecutions. That's right. So what you're saying is that David McBride's prosecution is political? Oh, absolutely it is, yes, yes. His problem was with the people at the top in the military who were not taking responsibility who, and are still not taking responsibility, who get away with blaming people at the lower echelons. So, you know, the only person who's been prosecuted is an ordinary soldier. It's not, you know, and, and I, I don't, you know, if he was uh, guilty of a war crime, then absolutely he should have been prosecuted. But he's part of a culture, and the people at the top are responsible for that culture. And that's what David McBride was so uh, up in arms about. And that's so important. You know, if we can't trust the people who are in charge, then we can't trust our government. Yeah. And when our government won't stand up and take responsibility, then, you know... You can't have, fix the problem. You'd have to wonder what sort of a democracy we're living in. Yeah. I sincerely had hoped we wouldn't have to be here for this last year, but things uh, haven't gone the way we had anticipated. And as you know, in May this year, David McBride was sentenced to five years and eight months imprisonment at the Andrew McConaughey Centre down here in Canberra. Right. This is a rubber stamp event today, just to get leave to appeal the sentence. The legal team is requesting leave so they can appeal the sentence. It's a little bit messy because the lodgement went in late due to delays on the court side, due to a change in the legal team and due to certain permissions that had to be granted to the legal team to investigate certain documents. So if you're a betting person, probably bet that it's going to get approved so he can appeal. Yay! All right, so thank you all for coming. To start us off, I'm going to invite Emma Davidson, our local Greens member, who's having a little not member moment till the election this next weekend. Uh, Emma's been a, a great supporter of David and for justice and for liberty. And she's always been there to help out and voice our voices for us when she's in her role as a local politician for the ACT. It is really important that when we're having conversations about who we are as a nation, who we are as a society and what's important to us, that we're bringing everyone in, that everyone needs to be able to participate in the conversation about what's important to us as a society and what our values are and what makes us who we are as a community. Now, what's going on in here today is largely a, an administrative process, but it's a really important part of the process. Now, it is not in the public interest for this to be dragged out. We want this to, to run smoothly. We want justice to be able to occur and for him to be able to continue with the process. So that's what's happening today is the start of all of that. Now, one of the things that we saw in the report that came down from the Royal Commission into Defence and Veteran Suicide was some talk about the impact of moral injury. And every time we drag out processes like this where we're actually talking about what's been happening and things take far too long and are far too difficult, it actually increases the level of mental distress for veterans and their families out there in the community. So as the Mental Health Minister, as the Veterans Minister, as the Corrections Minister, it's really important to me to see that justice is done properly, that people are able to go through those processes smoothly and not have them dragged out and take too long, because it is in the public interest for these things to not take all of that time. So I thank you all for coming here today, for continuing to show your support, not just for David, but also for his family. But remember that this is a person who has family and friends who love him and care about him and are really looking forward to seeing him again. And we want to make sure 
that that is something that can possibly happen at some point in the future. So in order for that to happen, we need this to happen today. But thank you all for coming and continuing to show your support. Thank you, Emma. Some of you may recognise this. The Public Interest Disclosure Act 2013, commonly known as the PID Act. It promotes integrity and accountability in the Commonwealth public sector. The PID Act encourages employees, former employees and others prescribed in the PID Act, provides protections for people who make a disclosure and requires agencies to take appropriate action. And that's it, that's the PID Act. Now I see a bit of discord there with what's happened to David and what David did. Hence we're here to protect David and to campaign for the Attorney General to fix the Whistleblower Act, which he hasn't done, which Labor promised to do if they were elected. So it's been a very disappointing episode for whistleblowers with this new government, which has not done what they've said to. So I'll now ask Kathy Vogan to come up. Kathy's a very seasoned reporter, journalist from uh, Consortium News based in Washington and Sydney. If you're not on Consortium News, I suggest you log in and check them out. They have some great journalistic work reporting on items around the world. Ready to go? Yeah. I usually improvise, but I've been reporting on the case and I need to just deliver you some information, be objective. I've also been reporting on the Assange case in London and reporting on the Assange case for 14 years, basically. In the course of those two cases, I've looked into British, American, Australian, Swedish, other law in relation to press freedom and national security. And so I thought I could offer you an international perspective. And I want to talk to you about what just recently happened in Strasbourg for our good friend Julian Assange. That's how we're going to start. In addition to declaring Julian Assange a political prisoner, the Council of Europe has just urged the United States, an observer state in the Council of Europe, to quote, urgently reform the 1917 Espionage Act to exclude its application to publishers, journalists, and whistleblowers who disclose classified information with the intent to raise public awareness about serious crimes. These are the views of 120 members of parliament in governments all around Europe, from all across the political spectrum. But amendments along the same line as proposed by the Council of Europe have already been drafted and proposed within the United States by Representative Rashida Tlaib of Michigan. They seek to heal the same malaise of punishing the wrong people. Don't shoot the messenger was the popular refrain and has been for 14 years in the case of Assange and also in the case of McBride. One can apply that. It is unlawful for sure, both in the United States and in Australia. David McBride assures me he has the legal qualification to do that to classify evidence of crime. But it is also forbidden to reveal unlawfully classified information. How contradictory is that? So the worst kind of misinformation gets to abound. The big lies by omission. As Harold Pinter observed, even while it was happening, it never happened. This is something we are experiencing every day where state narratives contradict what we see with our own eyes. And when we self-censor for fear of being disappeared, European parliamentarians have also called for an umbrella of protection for whistleblowers 
and journalists threatened from abroad by lawfare or worse for raising public awareness of serious crimes that have been ordered unspeakable. This is consistent with Article 10 of the European Convention on Human Rights, the freedom of expression right. And wouldn't we like a few of those here in Australia? We need a Bill of Rights, of course we do. We're a balancing act in Europe, Article 10, in the European Court of Human Rights, a balancing act must be done between the alleged violation of national security and the public's need to know this information. As the late and great John Pilcher once said, when secrecy is combined with impunity, bad things happen. We know that from the revelations of WikiLeaks, but we remain very contradictory in Australia. The Commonwealth Direction of Public Prosecutions advises that it is not in the public interest to prosecute a journalist for revealing serious crime, but the whistleblower who enables that work has no right to a public interest defence. The Afghanistan Inquiry, better known as the Brereton Report, the Afghanistan Inquiry Implementation Oversight Panel Report, held for release by our Attorney General until the day, very day of David McBride's sentencing, had nothing to say about the treatment of whistleblowers. It rather looked at ways of eliminating lofty ambitions, one might say, eliminating the possibility of serious crime altogether by our military. Its chapter on ethics suggested a prior decision-making process of triangulation be replaced by a theory of natural law, where war crime is always the wrong outcome. The panel highlighted negligence at the level of senior command in failing to recognize, quote, multiple signs that atrocities were being committed and failing to act in a way that would have ended this behavior much sooner. But do we have a remedy yet for protecting those who simply set the record straight? I don't think so. That is a conversation we need to have. Chelsea Manning suggested that misinformation could be our greatest problem for the next two decades. I think we sunk into that darkness decades ago. But a light has shone in Europe, a light that beams out the message, let us not call it a serious crime to tell the truth. Read the room, Australia. Thank you. I want to reinforce what Kathy has said. It is appalling what has happened to our military. Given all the resources, given all those guns and weapons, what have they allowed us to do? We are an invaded country. When Obama came to the parliament, he departed and went north to Darwin with Julia Gillard following. Shame. They signed a, forces, a status of forces agreement and immediately made it seat. The status of forces agreement is what power the hosting country has over the visiting military. Why do they want to keep this secret? We'd be eager to know that if a woman was raped by a Marine in Darwin, you want to know what law they face. They didn't want us to know because the fact was there was no liability. What the Americans do when they come, the American military, they whip them out of the country as fast as possible. There is no justice to be expected for the victims of crimes of military personnel in Australia. Understand, this is what this Labor government has delivered to us. 
an occupied country, how base can a military be when it actually invites in an army to occupy? That's what we have been delivered. So these generals who want to punish David McBride, who want to keep their medals, they are absolutely depraved. So where will justice come from? Just us, folks. When it comes to a crisis, it's just citizens like us assembling in public place, uniting and getting our message across the country. I'm a little bit like Craig. I wish I didn't have to do this. We've had a long campaign with Julius Assange, but we must do it again. And what's the benefit of doing this? Friendship. We win. We win. We win, friends. Thanks for listening. Thank you. Woo! Come out. Thank All you right, we're coming. going in now. Obviously, no cameras inside. Thank you for coming, everyone. But the truth cannot die in the face of their lies, and the truth will be his vindication. And David McBride had the truth on his side the day that he knew the whistle. All right, Guys, you've come the whole way up from Melbourne. Are you happy? Absolutely. Thank you all for coming, guys. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. and it's Thank worth you. it. Thank, Thank you. you. It's so yep. worth it to get yeah. here and to see that big <laughs> smile. Oh, talk soon. Craig Andrews, can I get your reaction to this outcome? Uh, well, we're very pleased they've granted him leave to appeal the case, which is a first step, and just hopefully the appeal goes well and they can uh, dismiss him at the end of it. We hope. So you hosted a meeting before the Yeah, we had a small started. rally here just Who to show, you? David. We're Which we're organization? The AAPP, the Alliance Against Political Prosecution. So we're working with Dan Duggan, uh, Richard Boyle. We were with uh, Assange and uh, Bernard Kaliri. And, of course, David McBride's our number one target right now to uh, get him out of prison. Yes. Well, March is a long way off, though, isn't it? It is, but that's what we've got to deal with, so uh, we have to work with it. Yes. So thank you all for coming and we all support for David and uh, people can donate if they want to on the uh, chuff.org uh, website for David McBride. For his appeal? For the appeal, yeah, yes, to fund well, the defence. We know now they're going to need the money. Yes, they yeah. will need the money yeah. for sure. So all thank right. you. Thanks, Kathy. Thanks, Craig. Thanks. Right, guys. Thanks. So, Bye. speaking of Assange, hey, <gasps> what a victory in that direction, eh? Exactly. Absolutely. And it's the boost we needed. Yeah, that we really yeah. needed that win yes. to re-energise us and to show us that we can do this. Yes. Well, I, I, and to see a community that values free speech yes. and a free press. Yeah, well, Without that, we're nothing. We're absolute slaves. Yes. Well, as I maybe got across in those few words, um, this is a... Yes, you this, did. This is a change of the weather. It's an international sea change. perspective. Internationally. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Internationally. And, um, and I think that's coming from... That spark's coming from Europe. It was... Yeah. But so many politicians from so many different countries, 120, yeah. right across the political spectrum. That's so refreshing. Thing. Yeah, yeah, to know that the globe, the, the, there's a community, a global community that yeah. actually values that democracy yet, and free speech, free press. Mm-hmm. That we're, we're capable as a humanity to actually be able to discuss these topics, that we don't need to be silenced. Yes. That we don't need to be minimized and subjugated constantly. Yes, and yeah. like children. So it's great, like that's right. <laughs> Treated like, like children. children. You're so not this... allowed to know about this. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> and this is the message I bring for David, is that we remember your courage and thank you so much for coming forward. Such a brave family. You know his father before him, and I just so much gratitude for the world that he paves the yes. future for. Yes, well, look, David was very, very pleased. Yes. It cheered him up that, that Julian yes. was freed yes. finally. And, Cheated um, us all up. Right. <laughs> we were all like, wow, really? <laughs> 15 years of campaigning. Oh, yeah, well, we went in the can at the time, and it sort of lightened his life for, you know, yeah. well. I was going to say for a moment, but I don't think so. I think it's really given him hope. Yeah. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And so you're going to be back up here? Um... Absolutely. Now we've got time to really prepare and campaign up yeah. until March. Yes. Um, to really keep going and pushing this. Yeah. And I tell you, I'm so grateful to Consortium News 
Oh, thank if you. you guys weren't here, it would have been up to social media that's to right. support that's events right. such as this. And this is We're turning groundbreaking. Up every single time, no matter where you are, you seem to make it back always. Yeah, yeah that's what Jennifer Robinson said. She said, "You guys are everywhere." Like yeah. I saw you in London last week. Yeah. <laughs> what are you doing here now? Because <laughs> ser you're serious journalists. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Getting serious around. Investigative journalists. Uh, yeah. That's what we need. Senator David Shoebridge, so nice to see you. We yeah, have seen some success in the courtroom in the Supreme Court today in Canberra for David McBride, where he has been given leave to appeal. Now, we won't know until the 17th of November exactly when that is going to be. The court would really like it to be in the week starting 3rd of March next, next year, of course. But the Crown is still umming and ahhing about whether that's a good time for them. So we're not quite sure yet when, but it's still a very long wait for David McBride. I would be very appreciative of your reaction because I know that you care quite a lot about this. Well, first of all, I think that the real crime is that David's in jail at all. I mean, David McBride told the truth about war crimes. And, um, and I think, as we've said before, Although he told the truth about war crimes, and thankfully he did, and there was an investigation which found, you know, dozens of instances of war crimes, um, alleged war crimes, I mean, proven finally in a court of law, but appallingly compelling evidence of Australian soldiers committing war crimes in Afghanistan. So far, he's the only person who's gone to jail, and he went to jail because he told the truth. Um, you know, it's a that's it's an abomination that that's the case, and of course. Not only did he go to jail, in the course of the prosecution, the Commonwealth did everything they could to reject a bunch of his evidence. They used national security laws to prevent the judge looking at evidence that David wanted to present in his defence. They, of course, buried, a, I think, a relevant but critical report that was done of culpability um, and the culpability of the leadership, of the ADF leadership, that was actually delivered to the government just days before the trial commenced um, last year in David McBride's case, and they only released grudgingly um, after his sentence, like soon after he was sentenced by the judge. Um, shameful behaviour by the government. Yeah, very um, gay. Yeah, it and, very um, gay, wasn't it? and of course, having rejected much of David's evidence, not allowing it to go to the judge to be in his defence, um, the judge then made a series of rulings that um, David had no duty to the public, um, either as a lawyer or otherwise, to tell the truth about some of the worst crimes imaginable, which is murder. Um, said no duty to tell anyone about crimes that include murder and that there was an overriding obligation to follow the orders of his superiors under the Defence Act and even if those orders were to cover up murder, he had to follow those orders. So it's pretty remarkable. And then having found that David had breached his obligation under the Defence Act to follow orders and say nothing and spill no secrets and then punished him incredibly harshly and repeatedly said, the judge repeatedly said, and it was on the urgings of the Commonwealth Director of Public Prosecutions, you know, and, and, and you know, on the, one would imagine, the the urgings of the Commonwealth Attorney General, um, not only convicted David, but then in sentencing said, I'm going to be particularly harsh and sentence you harshly to send a message um, and to stop other people telling the truth about things like war crimes if there was a in breach of some statutory obligation for secrecy. And, you know, I think I can't tell you how many times the judge mentioned that aspect in his sentencing, that he wanted to send a message. It was designed to, um, to be a disincentive to other whistleblowers. Um, so David's legal team, I'm, I'm not on his legal team, I haven't teased my way through the um, all the legal documentation, but it's my understanding they'll be challenging the conviction itself. Whether or not they're able to put fresh evidence in or not, it's really tough. You know, the government's hidden evidence and excluded evidence and you know, that's a really tough job to get it before an appeal court if it wasn't admitted at first instance. Um, but challenging some of those legal conclusions that David had no legal obligation to tell the truth about, you know, some of the most heinous crimes, including murder, and as well as 
you know, if that doesn't succeed, my understanding is they're challenging the severity of the sentence and saying, you know, the idea that there is no conceivable public interest, that there are no countervailing factors, um, you know, and the judge gave very little weight to those, you know, that's the nature of the appeal. But, I mean, today what we saw in court was, was two things, two really important things. One, the level of public support for David. Um, I, I, you know, it happened only a few kilometres down the road. I'm here in the Senate. It happened only a few kilometres. I couldn't get away. I, I wanted to get away, but I was stuck here doing senate things, you know, voting and stuff. Um, <laughs> but I'm told the um, the courtroom was packed, standing room. Yes, it was. When David came in, he was cheered, and I don't think the judge much liked that, but, you know, take it. You, you got to suck that up sometimes. Um, and, and as he left, he was cheered again. So I think it showed, again, incredible public support for David, and, and I'm, I'm grateful for that, and I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure he's grateful for that. And, and what was required today was because the, David had a change in legal team, there was a whole lot of documents to get your head around, a whole lot of material to get your head around. You normally only have 28 days from the delivery of the judgment to, to file a notice of appeal. And more than 28 days had passed between the time that the judgment was delivered and David's new lawyers had the chance to file the appeal. And because of that, they needed what's called leave of the court to extend the time effectively to, to have the appeal. And, and I don't think that was contested but was still required. The prosecution weren't opposing it and it would have been shameful if they had because, you know, it's an appeal about a man's liberty and a citizen's liberty. Um, but that was granted. And so now the appeal's properly on foot and the argument is, now the argument is how soon can we have it so David can have a, a day in court and try and get his liberty back. Well, well, that's it, yes. And so it hopefully it's going to be. And the court strongly urged we, we sat in front of, I was in the courtroom, the registrar was there, she had wanted David to come along, and thankfully he got there, and you're right, the first word we heard was awesome. <laughs> I was yeah. I was tweeting away to let people know what was going on. When I heard the word awesome, I knew that he'd walked into the room, he sat <laughs> down, and he put his hand in the air like that and yeah. beaming. And they were very restrained, in fact, the audience, when hmm. when the announcement came, I've decided to grant leave. Everybody sort of <gasps> gasped like that, but they didn't cry out. It was only when it was really all over that there was a lot of applause and cheers and yeah. things like that. But, David, it's still a very long wait for him, but at least he has a future now, a potential future. He has hope. And I heard from somebody close to David, I'm not going to drop any names, but I heard that when he got out, he said, that was fantastic. <laughs> you know, I'm personally grateful for everyone who turned up to court today and was able to do it and show support. You you know, David, he's been in jail, right? So the mm -hmm. idea that he can come to court and he can see other people outside of a jail setting and he can see that they're on his side, that that he matters, that people care about him. That's, yeah. you know, really important. I'm very grateful for everyone who turned up, and including yourself, Kathy, to show that support for David today. Um, I'm going to trot down and see him um, on Friday, hopefully, and, um, mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and try and break some of that routine that you get in jail and, you know, remind him that he has political support as well as public support, yeah. and, um, but also just to spend a bit of time with David because, he bloody well shouldn't be in jail. Um, now, there's other reasons why this appeal is incredibly important. I think it's incredibly important because the sentencing is a terrible precedent and it yeah. was designed to send, you know, a deterrent to other um, other whistleblowers and hopefully getting, if we can't, if the team can't succeed in setting aside the conviction, having the sentencing principles recognise that whistleblowing has public interest elements that is a relevant aspect for sentencing and um, and to take that into account rather than just whack someone for five and a half years. I think that would be of itself, that's an important reason to run the appeal. Yes. Um, so are those issues of duty and, you know, whether or not do we really live in a world where people in the Australian Defence Force must unquestionably follow orders, even if they appear unlawful, even if they're about covering up murder? That surely can't be the world we live in. Um, Isn't that the Nuremberg world? Well, you would hope we had learned from World War II and the findings there that said just blindly following orders mm. um, is not how 
a liberal democracy is not how the rule of law should actually work. But there's, I think, for David himself, you know, if he can't succeed in either reducing the sentence or having the conviction overturned, there's there's another terrible unfairness that he faces, which is at a Commonwealth level, there is no independent parole authority. Now, states and territories have things called parole boards, which are not controlled by the attorney. They're appointed normally by the attorney general, but they're independent statutory boards. And so when your minimum sentence period expires and you're eligible for parole um, at a state or a territory level, the application is made to a parole board. The parole board has a look and says, have you not been a good prisoner? Have you complied with prison rules? You know, are you likely to reoffend? Have you done X, Y, and Z? And they make an independent determination and people can be let out on parole before their sentence has, full sentence has yeah. expired. Now, David has, a, I think, a two and a half year non-parole period. Yes. Like a five year maximum sentence, right? Yes. yes. And the problem he has is, guess who the parole authority for David McBride is? Oh, no. It's oh, the Attorney it's... General. It's the Attorney was... General. <laughs> That's what I was going to Same person say. who was hot to trot to put him in jail. Um, uh, you know, that's the parole authority for David McBride. He has to appeal to the Attorney General or some person that the Attorney General delegates within his department under his direct control in order to determine David McBride's parole. And you can imagine if you were David and you're thinking, am I going to get a fair hearing from either the Attorney General who wanted me in jail or someone who works for him? Um, I, I, you know... It's, it's, it's terrible that there is no independent parole board. It's terrible that David faces that. And, of course, one of the things that no doubt the Attorney General would hold against David is that he does not show remorse. He, he has not said that what he did was wrong. And, and that would be a reason, no doubt, the Attorney General could use to keep him in jail for the full five years. So um, there's a lot riding on this. And, and David's case has just keeps exposing all of these unfair features um, mm -hmm in the criminal justice system as it's operated within the national security framework, just all these injustices. Yes. Well, I mean, Mark Dreyfus, our Attorney General, held the Afghanistan Inquiry Implementation Overview Panel report until after David McBride was sentenced. So I would assume that that, you know, because what was in there was that panel was saying very much the same thing as McBride in terms of... Yep. Well, blame should have been placed at a senior command level. War crimes would have been stopped a lot sooner. We talked about this the other day, we, David. We um, you know, you could imagine, though, if your liberty depended upon a decision by either the Attorney General or someone in the Attorney General's employ, um, when you know that the Attorney General has already refused to intervene, was quite comfortable with you being convicted for being a whistleblower, when you know all that, what possible confidence could you have that you'll get an independent parole decision? So a lot hangs on David's appeal. I wish him enormous, I wish him enormous goodwill in this appeal and I hope mm -hmm. everybody keeps following this closely because it's pointing to a pretty gross injustice um, at a Commonwealth level here. I just have one question about that. In terms of not being able to admit new evidence, the fact that the Attorney General released this report just after David was sentenced, does that mean that nothing from that report even could be admitted as evidence because it wasn't admitted well, at trial? Um, I, I'm not going to give David advice, um, off-the-cuff advice about, and, and I, I know the question you're asking is, is you know, in good faith. What, what, I, what I can say is that if you haven't been able to get the evidence in at trial, um, then evidence that um, it, it's a very high test you have to get what's called fresh evidence in on appeal. Yes. You have to pass a very high mm -hmm. test. And, you know, there's lots of different legal decisions at a state level and a federal level from appeal courts about what the test is. You know, one of the things that David has going for him is that he wasn't in possession of it and couldn't reasonably have been in possession of it at the time, even though it existed. Um, but against that is no doubt the Commonwealth will say, is it directly relevant? Um, it, does it relate to a ground of appeal? Um, it was reasonable what happened. You know, you could you could imagine the legal arguments going the other way. And as I said, it's a tough mm -hmm. threshold to pass to get an appeal court to admit fresh mm -hmm. evidence in on an appeal proceeding. I mean, mm -hmm. I think it would be critical if 
even if not for the conviction, for the question of sentencing. Um, but um, what I would say is it's a tough legal, it's a tough legal test that he has to face. Yep. Yeah. Well, he has some legal skills himself. So. Yeah. Sure. Yep. He's got a bit of time too, so maybe. You know, so. <laughs> David uh, Shoebridge, I'm so grateful of the time. I know you're you're terribly, terribly busy today <laughs> and this evening. So I'll let you go and I'll thank you very, very much. And um, please say hello to David McBride on my part. Well, I was able to wave to him today, but um, tell him I can't come because I'm reporting on the case. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, um, I will. I'll pass on your, your best regards. And, I'll, I'll, and I'm sure I'll pass on regards for, for many others too. And many I others. Thanks, thanks for following it too. Kathy. Thank you, Dennis Bye. Get out your notebook. If you are a consumer of independent news, then the first place you should be going to is Consortium News. And please do try to support them when you can. It doesn't have its articles behind a paywall. It's free for everyone. It's one of the best news sites out there. And it's been in the business of independent journalism and adversarial independent journalism for over two decades. I hope that with the public's continuing support of Consortium News, it will continue for a very long time to come. Thank you so much. <laughs>